I need to offer my thanks to Pastor Chris Lanier for reminding me of an announcement I forgot to make, and that is today in worship we are, in fact, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women, the 40th anniversary of the ordination of the first woman of color, and the 10th anniversary of the inclusion of partnered gay, lesbian clergy in the roster of the ELCA. So thank you, Chris, for reminding me of that. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew and continues Jesus' long teaching in Jerusalem as he approaches his death. Jesus says, For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master." And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Word of God word of life. Thanks be to God. And now we welcome Sarah Olson with a word for the children. Good morning, friends. Today's story is about the parable of the talents. And if you have your Spark Story Bible, I invite you to follow along with me on pages 316 to 317. Jesus told a story about using the gifts God gives us. A man was going on a trip. I need someone to take care of my money, he thought. He called his servants and handed each of them some talents. And that would kind of be like being handed a bunch of hundred dollar bills. In the time of Jesus, a talent was a coin that was worth a lot of money. Take care of this money while I'm away, he said. Two of the servants went to the market. They traded their talents and made more. One servant was afraid. He dug a hole and buried his talents. The man returned and two servants handed him more than they had been given. Good job, the man said. You shall have more. The third servant brushed the dirt from his talents. I was afraid, he said. I buried my talent. Give your talents to the others, the man said. You did not use what I gave you. I will not give you anymore. When God gives us special gifts and talents, God's hope is that we use them to multiply God's love in the world, not bury them in fear like the third servant did. And sharing God's special gifts and talents is a really unique way of sharing too. 
When I think of sharing, a lot of times I think about what I have to give up in order that someone else can have a piece of what I have. But God's sharing is different. When we share generously, we don't have less of God's love. Instead, God's love is multiplied. It grows. Think about it this way. Sharing our unique gifts and talents is like this bottle of bubbles. If it's sitting in a cupboard unused, it's not sparking any joy. It's not multiplying God's love. But if I take the bottle of bubbles out of the cupboard and blow some life into the bubble wand, God's love is multiplied just like the bubbles. Will you please pray with me? Dear God, thank you for entrusting us with special gifts and talents. Give us faith to boldly use what you have first given us to multiply your love in the world. Amen. Today, we recognize the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the ELCA. Technically, those first ordinations took place before the ELCA was birthed from its predecessor bodies of the ALC and the LCA and so on, but we bring those anniversaries forward with us. It's also the 40th anniversary of the ordination of the first woman of color and the 10th anniversary of the full inclusion of partnered LGBTQ pastors in the clergy roster. In this strange year of 2020, it feels good to celebrate something. Trinity called its first woman pastor, Betsy Dolmer Dart, in 1981, 11 years after it became possible, and 110 years after the first male pastor was called. I am the 11th woman pastor to serve Trinity and the first as lead. I stand on broad shoulders, and not just on the shoulders of the women who preceded me, but on the shoulders of the call committees and congregation members who follow the leading of the Spirit to recognize and celebrate the pastoral, prophetic, and preaching gifts of the women who have served Trinity for the past 39 years. Growing up, the idea of a woman in this role was completely foreign to me. I played church and priest from a young age, but I couldn't see beyond the limits of my own experience to imagine a girl robed in white standing at the front of a church for anything other than her first communion or her wedding. By the time it became clear to me that I was discerning a call to the ministry of word and sacrament, I was in my 30s. I had been Lutheran for 10 years and had still never heard a woman preach or lead worship. The first woman's voice I ever heard preach was my own, and it's a very, very scary place to start. Today is not the day for tales of the challenges of being a woman pastor, tales of being told no, dismissed, grabbed, teased, and infantilized. Tales of being rejected, harassed, demeaned because of my gender, because of our gender. Today, I don't want to cry. Today, I want to celebrate. So instead, I want us to focus on doing the right thing even when we are scared. The holiness of unearthing the talents and, gift and gifts of those who have been too often rejected. And the great surprise that shouldn't be a surprise when those who have been pushed to the side step to the front and proclaim the gospel. But first, we must deal with this parable of the talents. The gift of parables is that they don't necessarily mean one thing or what we think they mean, and they invite us to listen deeply and imaginatively. This parable is commonly preached in conjunction with Stewardship Sunday because it seems to be about the bold use of the talents and resources given to us by God and how what we do with what we have can create more. And we assume this parable, like so many others, is describing the kingdom of God. But it begins with Jesus saying, for it is as if. What is as if? 
the kingdom of God is as if, the world is as if. It's not clear what Jesus is talking about, and we think Jesus is describing God entrusting us with gifts which we faithfully use or unfaithfully hide. But the master in the story is described as an admittedly harsh man, reaping where he does not sow and gathering where he does not scatter. If this is a parable describing the kingdom of heaven, how do we reconcile it with the kingdom Jesus describes in the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor, the meek, the grieving, the persecuted. Surely the same God who blesses the meek with the earth isn't a harsh master who tosses the fearful into the outer darkness. If the parable is describing the world, then perhaps the fearful slave becomes a prophetic hero, refusing to participate in the predatory fiscal practices policies practiced by wealthy landowners of the time, a champion for economic justice and workers' rights. But then as the punishment he receives, God's punishment or the world's punishment. Here's yet another option. What if this parable is about our misperceptions regarding God? What if the parable shows us how it can all go pear-shaped when we forget the God described in the Beatitudes? What happens when we assume God is harsh and merciless and only blesses those who get it right? What if it's about what happens when we live in fear rather than in the confidence of God's grace? What is it that stood in the way of women's ordination and still stands in the way for so many women powerfully gifted by the Spirit, but whose traditions or congregations resist the call? Why has the church said no for millennia? Why do congregations, even in the ELCA, still say no? The Bible is full of women who led and risked and prophesied Miriam, Deborah, Esther, Ruth, Mary Magdalene, Lydia, the woman who dared publicly touch the cloak of Jesus, the woman who debated the worth of her daughter to be healed, the woman who washed Jesus' weary feet when no one else did. In the last verses of his letter to Rome, Paul names Phoebe, a deacon, Prisca, an evangelist, another Mary, Junia and Julia, all workers for the young church and for the Lord, women across the ages who advanced the dream of God through obedience, resistance, evangelism, martyrdom, motherhood, and hospitality, including the hospitality, faith, and courage of Mary offering up her body to welcome the incarnation of God. Even the patriarchal male written Bible bears witness to the powerful role of women in the dream of God. So where did we lose that dream? Where did we go wrong? Did we capitulate to a few verses that consign women to roles dictated by culture and custom rather than to God's inclusive vision and broad call? Did we fear retribution for getting it wrong? Did we fear God's punishment for dreaming too big and for engaging the talents of women in churchly realms? Did we fear what power might look like in the hands of those who can endure childbirth? Did we fear what might happen if bodies that had for centuries been castigated as the source of sin became bearers of gospel proclamation instead? Did we bury the talents of women because we feared God? or because we feared women? And what of black and brown bodies? In what vision of God's kingdom are those bodies no more than tools for laboring in fields and factories? What did we fear when their voices broke forth with proclamations that blew the scales from our eyes about what the kingdom of God might actually look like? What scared us about the idea of a beloved community and a moral universe arcing toward justice? And our LGBTQ siblings, why did we allow ourselves to take offense at their bodies and their proclamation 
and stuff them into rigid silence if they dared to make public promises of faithful, monogamous, committed love and to raise families. Today, we celebrate 50 and 40 and 10 years of scraping away the earth that buried the gifts of too many for far too long. Today, we celebrate a God of enormous imagination and variety who plants within all people the imprint of God's self and then calls those people into proclamation and leadership entrusting bread and wine and water into, the hu into human hands of every strength, every color, and every size. Jesus' words are manna, manna to aching souls, male and female, black and brown, gay and straight, when Jesus says, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city on the hill. This parable can be read in as many ways as there are people listening this morning. But certainly together we can hear Jesus calling us away from fear and into confidence in the blessed kingdom of God. It is not God who excludes. It is fear that excludes. The whole of this journey through the gospel of Matthew has been one of calling us away from fear and back to Jesus' description of a kingdom of God that blesses and blesses and blesses again, pouring out abundant grace and hopeful expectation that we will grab hold of this gift with everything we are, no matter who we are and reminding us not to let our fear stand in the way of what God wills for us. Sharing power, sharing proclamation, the inclusion of all who bear God's image, and the welcome of voices and bodies of enormous variety. Trinity, thank you, thank you for calling Betsy, Lynn, Chris, Siri, Chris, Candy, Stephanie, Deb, Stephanie, Carrie, and me. I dare speak for all my sisters when I offer prayers that we continue to have an imagination for what new voices, other voices, silenced voices might have to tell us, to tell the world about the dream of God in the name of Jesus Christ who blesses us all. Thanks be to God. Amen.